so i request you to please wait and uh, in case you have any queries you can put it in the chat box and we'll uh, we'll be happy to answer that we'll be starting very shortly uh, in about one or two minutes <clears throat> Vimal, can you flash the first slide so that we can start? Hi, Hi everyone. Good morning and good afternoon. This is Sheetal. I'm the lead uh, strategy and outreach for Finuvista, which is the in-country partner for MEX program in India. And welcome to the sixth talk series for the MEX program, which is, and today's topic is women in clean clean cooking. Uh, I'll start my uh, discussion while other people are joining in. So without much more time on that, uh, to give you a very brief scenario about the clean cooking uh, in India, uh, basically it's not uh, that the uh, Indian government has now started focusing on uh, the clean cooking. We all know that the kind of, uh, uh, you know, impacts of uh, health and safety and environment that the cooking on traditional fuel has in India. Uh, the Indian government has been taking active initiatives and with the Pradhan Mantri Ujula Yojana, uh, we've seen that the government has taken a, you know, a leapfrog initiative to shift towards clean cooking. But still, uh, you know, there are uh, pertaining issues with respect to the high cost of uh, uh, refilling when it comes to the LPG cylinders. And we see that, uh, you know, a study indicates that despite, uh, you know, a 99.9% .9 coverage of LPG connections in April 2021, when it comes to the beneficiary of PMUI scheme, then we see 50% of Ujwala Yojana beneficiaries refilling just zero to three uh, cylinders per year. Uh, this can be attributed to the high cost of uh, refilling the cylinders. If I talk about today, uh, uh, typically a refilling would cost 899 rupees at a commercial cost and uh, rupees 594 at a subsidized cost. And you know, this is a a strong reason, you know, why people in the rural areas and BPL households keep going back to the traditional fuels. The other aspect with respect to cooking on LPG is that, you know, it incurs high imposed costs for the country. India is basically a, a, a country which has moved on to a status of electricity surplus nation. But still, when we look at the reliance on electric cooking, uh, there is minuscule reliance on electric cooking, which is, you know, almost about zero. Government of India has been taking recently some initiatives like the master campaign Go Electric, in which electric cooking is one of the second most important areas after electric vehicle, which, uh, you know, for which we, they are promoting uh, the use of electricity. Uh, uh, Vimal, can you move on to the next slide? When I talk about MEX program, most of us are aware that uh, MEX program is a five-year funded program by UK8, which supports and invests in clean cooking alternatives to achieve this transition of clean cooking. The program is a pioneer in e-cooking worldwide with active interventions in 15 African and Southeast Asian countries. The program was launched in India in February 2020 
and Finovista has been the in-country partner for the program. Uh, we worked out a very detailed strategy and a roadmap for the program in India to enable the transition to clean cooking. Uh, Finovista, as an in-country partner in India, has been working with all the major stakeholders in India. Next slide. So basically the program has some major stands on which it's working in the country. Of course, uh, the promotion of electric cooking is one important aspect. Uh, with respect to innovation management, nurturing, uh, uh, you know, the Indian startups in clean cooking domain, uh, scaling up and providing market access to the device manufacturers in India, working on researches and pilot uh, initiatives in the country, and with respect to other activities, MEX in India is basically working with the stakeholders very closely, uh, whether it's the business chambers, whether it's the discoms, uh, utilities, whether it's uh, various uh, government departments, institutions. Next slide. Uh, now I'll take up uh, very briefly the small, uh, you know, uh, the initiatives under each and every head and the landmark achievements that we've been able to cater to in a very short span of time. So MEX in India has basically, uh, you know, is working with the startups in India and nurturing their capabilities with respect to, uh, you know, them being, uh, uh, you know, global recognized brands. So one of the examples is Ufla. It's a startup, uh, it's a device manufacturer based out of Pune, and it has recently won the Global Leap Awards in 2020. Mex in India is closely working with startups like these in their capability and capacity development. And I'm happy to share that in a small, uh, uh, you know, in a small time of one and a half years, the startup has gone ahead to establish a full-fledged manufacturing facility and is now ready and capable to service orders on a very large scale for the domestic and the international consumers. We've been working with such startups very closely in nurturing their capability, connecting them with finance, helping them with market access, and time to time helping them with compliances and statutory requirements. Next slide. Uh, when I talk about, uh, you know, market access support and I talk about, uh, um, you know, how we've been helping the startups, uh, the uh, next slide. Next slide, please. Right. Uh, no, next slide. Uh, uh, previous slide, sorry. Can you move on to the previous slide? Yeah. When I talked about uh, working with the startups in India, one of the important initiatives that uh, MEX in India is working with is that we are working very closely with Energy Efficiency Services Limited in India in their program of large scale procurement for electric devices. Now, how is MEX working uh, uh, with them? So we are basically working in adding elect uh, innovative electric cooking devices like electric pressure cookers in the, their program. Recently, we've actually conducted uh, a series of meetings with the manufacturers based out in India on how uh, uh, they can be prepared for large scale procurement under such programs and how electric cooking can be promoted. We are very closely working with the discoms and utilities to promote electric cooking to their users and to people in their network. Uh, we are also working with EESL uh, with respect to the fact that we know that electric cooking currently in its current form has a lot of challenges when it, uh, you know, when you come to cooking an entire palette of uh, Indian cuisines. So when I talk about flatbreads, when I talk about roasted foods, uh, you know, there are some challenges. Happy to share that MEX is very closely working with the manufacturers, with EESL as a program company to overcome such challenges. We are involving, uh, uh, you know, experts and uh, device manufacturing companies 
and uh, uh, you know device uh, designers to overcome these challenges next slide Can you move on to the next slide? Max in India is also working under their initiatives with respect to a lot of mapping studies. So we, uh, as I told you earlier, we've almost mapped the entire clean cooking ecosystem in the country. Aside to that, from time to time, we are also engaging ourselves in terms of working out on studies with respect to what are the comparative cost of electric cooking devices? What is the range which is available for such devices? Uh, with respect to mega kitchens, what are the kinds of facilities available? What are the kind of devices that they are using? So such kind of mapping studies and analysis is continuously working and we are sharing uh, uh, you know, these knowledge to the MEX program team to be shared further to the program countries of MEX program. Next. Can you move on to the next slide? I think there is a hiccup currently. Uh, can you move on to the next slide? Okay. Screen is, uh, no, is, is my screen is not moving? No, it's not moving. It's frozen. We can still see clean cooking uh, over here, study analysis and mapping. It, it was actually moving at my end. I could see the slides right, going back and forth. See. OK. Yeah, hope, hope now you can see. Yeah. Yeah, can you move on to the next slide after this? Right. So like I told you that uh, Mex in India is actively engaged in the promotion of e-cooking. Uh, we've, uh, uh, you know, organized multiple events and have partnered with multiple agencies on the clean cooking domain with respect to promotion of such, uh, uh, you know, initiatives on a larger forum. Uh, one of the examples was that in 2020, we conducted, uh, uh, you know, a partner event with one of the business chambers that is CII in their device, uh, uh, you know, uh, global design summit in 2020 on promoting electric cooking. Next slide. So basically, when I talk about the fact that MEX in India within a span of one and a half years has been able to uh, enable the transition in clean cooking. And, uh, uh, you know, there are multiple initiatives that we have taken. One of the master initiatives is talk series that, that we are a part of right now. Uh, you know, when we started this program in the country, we uh, we had an experience that uh, when we talk about the transition to clean cooking, there are multiple stakeholders that need to be involved. And there is not even, uh, you know, there's not even one single subject uh, uh, which is not critical to this kind of a shift. And therefore, we came up this uh, with this talk series concept is basically a 12 module series which we call as MEX talk series in which we talk about, uh, you know, we conduct the series on a monthly basis. And uh, uh, today is the sixth session of this talk series uh, with the topic of women in clean cooking. Uh, uh, the impact of these talk series, uh, uh, you know, we could gather that after we were able to build in critical connections between the stakeholders after the talk series on each and every topic. And we consciously pick up topics which are critical to the transition of clean cooking. Uh, and with this, uh, you know, I will not take much more time and uh, invite my panelists for today, uh, 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 the entire panel for today. Uh, you can stop presenting women. Uh, so uh, I'd like to invite Ms. Sylvia Satori, uh, the Senior Project Manager, Women Economic Empowerment, Energia. Uh, Sylvia uh, has been uh, having a more than 15 years of experience at the nexus of energy and environment, women's empowerment and entrepreneurship. 
private sector development, innovation and sustainability in the scope of many international development projects, particularly those funded by European Commission and with a special focus on Asia. She holds a master's degree in SME management and a development and a master's degree in Asian studies. I would like to invite Sylvia now to take on the session. Thank you, Sheetal, and thank you for uh, opening the webinar and for um, handing over the, uh, the mic. Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this interesting and very timely discussion. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers, Max and Finn Visten, for inviting me to participate to this event. I'm honored to join this excellent and inspiring female panelist who will help us unpack many of the dimensions that characterize women and clean cooking. And I'm also personally very pleased to be back in India, although unfortunately still virtually only. Energia is uh, the organization that I'm working with, is an international network of organizations that foster access to and control over sustainable energy for girls and women. This year, we are celebrating our 25th anniversary. And in our journey so far, we have worked extensively in Africa and in Asia, including in India. At Energia, we believe that clean and efficient cooking is one of the most important interventions for women. And we have been and are involved in a number of projects and advocacy initiatives that advance it. In fact, I'm also happy to share that with our colleagues and friends at MEX, we are currently implementing a new program called Gender and Energy Innovation Facility, where we are supporting innovators in Africa and in Asia to experiment new solutions in the gender and energy space. The projects have started very recently, so it's still too early for me uh, to share with you any insights and findings from these experiments. However, I can tell you already that clean cooking is one of the main topics that our innovators have decided to venture into. So I really invite you to closely follow uh, the space on, on our website and our social media for more in insights on how these new experiments on the ground will advance in the uh, clean cooking uh, uh, innovation for girls and women. So I, I was asked to say a few words before leaving the floor to our panelists. And I would like to take these initial minutes to help set the scene for our discussion today. With our esteemed panelists, we will investigate specific aspects of the relation between women and clean cooking. But before diving into them, I would like to define a bit the framework of this theme and in particular, in particular look at uh, two aspects. I don't know if you can see my, my slides. Are, I cannot see them. Uh, Sheeta, uh, are, my, are my slides visible? Yeah, now they are. Now they are. Yeah. Can you please move on to the next one? Thank you. Yeah. So there's two elements in particular I would like to briefly touch upon. The first one is why this topic matters at all. And the second one, uh, I would like to cover a bit the holistic approach that is needed to address it. So to the next slide, please. Thank you. So why does uh, women and clean cooking matter at all as a question? I could actually respond to this subject simply by referring you to the figures that you see here to the left. The World Bank estimates that almost 3 billion people in the world still lack access to clean cooking, and only 27% of the population in South Asia has access to it. As you can well imagine, or probably already know, in both instances, girls and women account for the majority of those who are deprived of access to clean cooking which is already for a start, a major point. Secondly, as women are predominantly the ones who take care of the household, of, the, of cooking, of acquiring cooking fuels, they are also the ones being affected the most by indoor air pollution, the silent killer in developing countries. Household air pollution from cooking, from cooking with solid fuels already causes more than 4 million premature deaths every year. It increases the risk of respiratory infections and leads to a higher mortality rate for women infected with COVID. Third, this overall situation, which is already bleak, has become even more severe with the current COVID outbreak, which has not only exacerbated long-standing inequalities, but has also put women on the front lines of the pandemic. 
Fourth, all of this shows very clearly that at this pace, we are very likely to miss the 2030 deadline for achieving universal energy access. Universal access to clean cooking, which is part of SDG 7, cannot be achieved without bold and ambitious commitments, including in post-COVID recovery plans. It cannot be achieved without women being decision makers, co-investors and providers of clean cooking solutions. In fact, and this is the fifth point, women are also critical to universal access to energy because of their unique position to reach last mile consumers of energy products and services, given their ability to connect with the customers and to access untapped market. So, and this is a very important point I'd like to make, women are not just victims, but they're also very powerful drivers of change. Moving on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So what we need is a holistic approach that includes and tackles several elements. We need to create the necessarily political momentum for clean cooking solutions, to increase public support, to drive potential solutions and spur investments. Clean cooking needs to be a key message from political leaders. Actually, not just a message. Political leaders need to commit to clean cooking and take action. It is encouraging and inspiring to see women and international fora like this one here today. We need more of this fora and more women prominently featured at negotiation tables in national and international policy and decision making. While over the past few years, we have seen an increase in women at these events, we are still far from reaching a significant and critical percentage of women in energy fora and policy making tables. At the same time, we need the women's movement to take on clean cooking. Part of the narrative coming out of the movement needs to include clean cooking. It is an issue that should be on their agenda, but also the mobilization needs to be there. There's a huge potential in the women's movement to demand clean cooking and to tackle the issue, we need to tap into that potential. Importantly, we need to ask women what their needs and priorities are. This should be guiding the technology, the fuels, the market mechanisms, and the financing that we design and promote. In other words, women need to be involved at all levels at aspects of the clean cooking challenge and in the clean cooking value chain. Women need to be involved in technology development, in awareness raising and education, in access to and adoption of clean cooking services. As women are the ones who predominantly use clean cooking services and technologies, they are the ones who can better tell us what works and what doesn't in which context. When they speak from their own experience, women are best equipped to persuade other women to purchase and use clean cooking products. With their vast networks in communities and many women already being entrepreneurs, women are the ones who can provide access to clean cooking technologies in rural and hard to reach communities. Another dimension that is important to consider is that of financing and investment. Funds for clean cooking solutions should be translated into specific gender indicators and desired gender results. For instance, if you have an investment fund, one of the results could be having a specific target that focuses on scaling up women-led businesses and women's entrepreneurship in the sector. An indicator on women's leadership in the sector could be another one. So I will stop it here for now, and I am sure our panelists will help us move to the next level to understand how these needs can be translated into practice and into actionable strategies. To start with, I would like to turn to Professor Jyoti, Executive Director of the Integrated Research and Actions for Development. Professor Jyoti, you have a very elaborate experience of working in the domain of clean cooking. As women are the primary users of clean cooking solutions, can you share your views on how women can be strategically engaged in the development of policies in the domain of clean cooking? Thank you. Thank you, Silvia, and thank you, Fino Vista, for inviting me. Uh, we are also celebrating 25th uh, anniversary of Energia, of which I have been member from the very beginning, uh, 25 years ago, and also uh, uh, today is Bangladesh uh, liberation uh, anniversary uh, uh, and we know that uh, Bangladesh uh, has come very far by put, putting emphasis on women on all aspects of uh, development. 
Um, so clean cooking is really about uh, the center of that is uh, women's uh, uh, empowerment. Because, uh, you know, you people take, <clears throat> let's say, air pollution. But when you look at the entire value uh, chain, it's not just air pollution. It starts from uh, collecting and gathering in the woods and then transporting for long distances and then uh, processing, drying, making uh, sticks and uh, chopping it and so on. And then comes the cooking. Uh, and uh, certainly air pollution is important, but it does not solve the entire problem uh, uh, if, if you just do improved stores. So um, uh, with, with, unless you look at the whole uh, spectrum of uh, ways in which women are affected, uh, we may not be able to solve this problem. So, um, uh, but gradually, it has come, and I remember say it took too long uh, than, than I would have liked because I wrote a paper of gender issues in energy policy in the journal called Energy Policy uh, way back in 95, where I advocated that uh, we must get uh, the people, uh, women must get LPG now. And um, frankly, if we had done that, perhaps uh, we would have been much better off because of the not only just uh, health of women, but the households and um, uh, women would have had more time and something similar to uh, developed countries could have happened. Uh, they were co completely bogged down with uh, uh, energy value chain. Now, uh, coming to uh, Ujwala, I was also active supporter of Ujwala, uh, and, uh, but now I feel uh, and we used to have many meetings with uh, Minister Pradhan and so on. But now I feel uh, we should uh, uh, move on for several reasons. Uh, uh, one is that the LPG moves on four wheels, two wheels, uh, whatever it is. Um, and uh, that's not how the energy should be moving. Uh, secondly, uh, so it has, an it has energy costs uh, uh, in it. Uh, well, another thing is that uh, uh, it is, of course, uh, now or nowadays with climate change concerns, uh, people are talking about it. But of course, I would never agree that uh, uh, these things should be done for, for climate change because there are many more urgent things that have to be done for climate change. And, and uh, this is the last thing that has to be done for, for that reason. But uh, we, another reason is that we would never reach this, this kind of scale still, we have um, uh, made a very big uh, beginning and very uh, uh, substantial uh, contribution by switching to uh, Ujwala and I'm, uh, but yet it will not uh, 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 complete our SDG 7 goal uh, dream and uh, or, or goals and that um, um, SDG 7, uh, requires uh, a technology mix and that technology mix has to be uh, another one is the electricity. Now electricity is uh, in far more households, whether it is in India or Africa or everywhere, there are more households with electricity than any other. Of course, the quality and um, uh, the, uh, you know, the access has, has not yet reached at that level where some of them can cook. Sometimes it's just good enough, uh, low voltage uh, with uh, uh, light fans, bulbs, uh, and TV, television, uh, and this needs power quality and electricity. But um, uh, yet, it, once the wires are there, it's quite possible to connect them. And they have to be connected for other reasons as well, not just for cooking. So perhaps we should focus on um, seeing how this can be uh, done with uh, two, three uh, technologies. In energy, we have uh, always had a technology mix at, at the national and global level. Uh, at any given time, we have five, four, five, six energy uh, technologies, whether it is coal, gas, um, solar, wind, nuclear, hydro, and so on. We always have technology mix. So why just rely on LPG? So we need to have electricity, but 
uh, electricity also in a grid as well as solar. So that is again another mix that we may need. And uh, we really need to map out the SDG 7 strategy. Uh, otherwise, uh, with just uh, LPG, we may not make it. Uh, though I fully support. Uh, and we need also pipe natural gas, PNG uh, for urban areas, LPG for urban plus uh, surrounding areas and electricity everywhere. And gradually, uh, after some time, uh, I think first goal is to reach 100% uh, households. But gradually, we may even want to retire LPG because of the climate change concerns. But right now, uh, I would not say that um, the women should pay price for the some other uh, you know rich people's uh, uh, whether it's that they are in their own country or elsewhere uh, uh, problems uh, they they should be first given uh, whatever they uh, they their de uh, development calls for and then we we uh, uh, so once once they have a habit of uh, clean cooking they will not go back to the old ways. Uh, though right now, because of the inadequate number of LPG, sometimes it happens. But we have done some surveys and then uh, it seems that they, uh, uh, some of them said we will not go back to biofuels because uh, we, uh, but some, some about 28% said if it gets too expensive, we will go back to biofuels. But 42% uh, 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 talked about or even a uh, larger percent, uh, and then some were neutral also. Uh, they made other conditions. But uh, the, uh, uh, they said, we'll use uh, less, we'll save from other other uh, others, uh, expenses, but we will continue to stick to LPG. And certainly, none of us will uh, 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 do that uh, to shift to biofuels. It's too now uh, far for us. I mean, us means people like uh, <laughs> who are listening here, but uh, also much, much uh, less uh, privileged people uh, uh, will not move back to biofuels at, after some point. So we should um, uh, take this opportunity and uh, try to see uh, appropriate technologies wherever, uh, uh, wherever, uh, and, and that would depend on the uh, the place as well as income levels as well as uh, women's own uh, emancipation emancipation uh, 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 and uh, we should now uh, really uh, uh, make sure that SDG 7 uh, plan are plans are underway and in, uh, that cannot be done without a, a good mix of technologies later on when we move on to net zero emissions uh, first of course it's the power sector then electric vehicles will come there but that at some point all the households will have to also switch to that uh, but that's that's a little far away but we should keep that in mind when we do these strategies so i think that's how i see the scenarios that what we were doing in 95 uh, uh, when energy started and what we are doing now we are also doing electric uh, PPC uh, promotion in Nepal with Max. And we recently, and before that, we wrote uh, a, a, a technical paper, issue paper, with Joan Cloak of Max and Eliza uh, Pozzolo and so on, three, three, four, uh, uh, Daniel Pope. Four of us uh, wrote uh, this paper on uh, why electric cooking must be introduced before the, the Max started this program, so about uh, three years ago, three years ago. Thank you. So, uh, uh, and Simon Bachelor, perhaps I hope he is listening. Uh, he uh, also has a lot to contribute in this electric pressure cooker and battery based uh, cooking. Uh, so we need to uh, bring all, all of that in and uh, ensure the complete coverage of all households everywhere in this world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Jyoti, for your vast uh, insights and for touching upon a number of critical areas we should definitely take in, into account. 
Um, I would like to move on then to our next uh, panelist, uh, Ms. Shalu Agravel, who is a senior program uh, lead with the Council of Energy, Environment and Water. Shalu leads the Council's work on residential energy access, demand side management and power sector reforms. She uses data to study the changing energy landscape and devise strategies to ensure universal access to affordable, reliable and sustainable energy. So, Shalu, according to you, how would the transition to clean cooking change if more women were involved in underground pilots, research programs, and building initiatives? In particular, would this wider engagement of women accelerate the pace of behavior change of consumers and thereby accelerate the adoption of clean cooking solutions? Thank you so much, Sylvia, and uh, thank you also, uh, Dr. Parikh, for your uh, you know intervention. Uh, I mean, the fact that cooking is predominantly a gendered role, uh, unfortunately, though, uh, you know, uh, we need a gender lens to study this problem, going beyond just the lens of energy poverty, which has mostly you know dominated the sector. And and that's because I mean, uh, if you just look at it from a household perspective, you know, there's so many priorities that. Uh, you know, a household has to take care of, you know, to manage within their budget. And the question of how do you allocate resources, right? Uh, and where does clean cooking sits into that priority becomes important. And, uh, and then the question of whether women have the agency to question, you know, influence that decision becomes important. And as researchers, I think uh, having more women on the field definitely makes a difference, uh, you know, because um, these are very personal questions, right, that we are trying to understand. Uh, if we have more women foots on the ground, uh, we certainly are able, uh, you know, to ask more re relevant questions, uh, able to identify bottlenecks, able to collect better data. And that's something that any researcher who's collecting primary data on the field would, uh, you know, know that even when you have to do surveys, right? Uh, and, and we have done lots of large scale surveys in India, across states, uh, you know, over many years. And we try to make sure that, you know, uh, even within the surveys, uh, you know, we have at least, you know, 50% women and it's often difficult to find, right? So it's not so easy to come by and, and to make them also, you know, comfortable and safe while they are approaching those households on the field. So it, it is also a question of how do you make women researchers, right, comfortable on the field, trying to understand the changing landscape, which then can also yield us better data, you know, when we are trying to understand. But I also think we need to go take a step further as researchers i mean it's not just about gender i mean okay gender is the first step but uh, are we, we also need to be proximate even even those who are designing the research right so are we able to empathize with those whose life we are trying to change do we understand their context do we understand the kind of uh, sort of uh, you know pulls and pressures they have to manage and it's not just as simple to say that okay let's empower women and you know, the, ch the change will happen. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, we all need to, uh, I think definitely there's, uh, the change will be faster if there are more women on the ground. Uh, but, but, you know, women who are also committed to, you know, understand, immerse themselves in the context and, you know, try to answer the questions that have not been answered. Thank you, Sharu, for adding this more uh, human dimension to, to the topic and to the complexity indeed of the issue. Yeah, indeed, uh, gender is just part of the of the puzzle, but it's not the one and only element to be taken into account. We've already heard of a number of them, ranging from the uh, technology to policy to indeed the ability to empath empathize with, uh, with the uh, final users. That's a very important one. Thank you for that. And adding on to that, I I'd like to turn now to Dr. Uh, Minal Vivek Cabra who is uh, uh, actually from the manufacturing perspective. She is the co-founder of Kivu, a kingdom of uh, good food, uh, which she has started in 2019 with a vision of providing sustainable livelihood opportunities to rural women by baking healthy food using solar energy. So, Minal, as a manufacturer, how do you factor into the product innovation, the user feedback and consumer friendliness when your consumers are largely women? So again, we're going back a bit to the human interaction element here. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, so we tend to understand what appeal them the most. When we talk about the cooking, it's about uh, cooking dal, roti, chapati, your daily vegetables, then uh, drying and roasting also. 
but uh, when we talk about cooking specifically uh, like dal and all this is a daily task right so and it is very time specific but uh, so it is very difficult uh, to change the uh, women in general because uh, it is difficult to uh, bake uh, like your chapatis on the solar when it comes to drying and roasting these are not the urgent task so uh, it is very uh, easy to shift them to the uh, solar ovens and solar dryers so we have we have designed the solar uh, roasters and dryers which are very uh, convenient to use and so the shift of the women is very easy from the conventional better to the solar uh, ovens uh, then we have designed uh, solar cookers uh, that are portable and can be carried to the work site also and uh, like chapatis and all this takes a uh, lot of time so our more focus will uh, it had been to the uh, boiling and baking also thank you thank you for this uh, direct insights from from the uh, the ground I'd uh, then like um, first to remind our audiences if that if you have any questions or any comments or any reactions to what you've been uh, hearing from our panelists, you're welcome to uh, to share them in the chat and we will pick them uh, as the event develops. And in the meantime, uh, I'd like to start a new round of, uh, of questions and invite our panelists to share their views about an aspect that in fact has already been uh, mentioned on Passan, meaning we know that in rural uh, and upcountry locations, women are generally not the one who make uh, the purchase decisions. And this applies also to cooking devices and equipments. Uh, so these are decisions usually taken by men or in any case men do do play a big role in influencing the uh, domestic decisions so in, in your experiences how can empower how can we empower this kind of women to make informed decisions and also to be able to contribute and be part of the decision making process at home anyone uh, can take the question professor parik if you would like to go first uh, you're welcome to Otherwise, we can. Um, I can go otherwise. Um, or Minal, you want you want you wanted to go first. You you go on. No no issue. All right. Uh, well, I think um, I mean indeed uh, lack of women's uh, you know participation and decisions concerning cooking is a concern. Um, I mean from our latest uh, round of uh, Pan India household survey that we conducted, uh, you know, between 2019 and 2020, we find that almost 40% uh, households, uh, you know, uh, females uh, members are able to order LPG refills, which means like in the remaining 60%, it's still uh, a decision that is influenced by men, even though they're not the ones who are involved in the cooking process. And that certainly is disconcerting, but I mean, the positive side is, uh, sorry, just give me a second. I think there's some uh, noise from my side. Is it okay? Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you clearly. Okay, thank you. Me. Thank you. Right. So uh, I think these stats, of course, tell us where we are, but we need to better understand, right? What are the uh, uh, reasons why uh, such decisions are not being taken by women when it should naturally happen? I mean, is it because of lack of ownership of uh, say phones with the women that they can't order a refill? Uh, is it because of lack of uh, ability to move on their own? Like, you know, lack of, uh, you know, ability right. to drive a car or a vehicle? Because often we see that, you know, uh, the fuel is not access or accessible on the time, right? Uh, we also see that, uh, you know, uh, from our different study uh, where we uh, did a survey with urban slums in six, uh, you know, North Indian states, that uh, the women's status in the household uh, positively, I mean, as a household head, positively correlates with the household using LPG as a primary fuel, which which is a clear indication that, you know, if uh, as the women's uh, sort of um, role in decision making improves in general, that also positively reflects on, uh, you know, the greater use of clean cooking fuel. And of course, we are, I mean, the anchor here is LPG, but that could be extended to even electric cooking or other means of clean cooking. Uh, the question on how can we influence uh, women's choice, I, I would like to tackle it, uh, answer it in two ways. Uh, in the short term, I think, of course, making information more accessible 
in in the format that women can actually understand becomes important like how do you enroll in programs that are being run by the government how do you buy a new device are i mean what are the modes that women have access to and we should be doing the marketing through those rather than the common modes that men usually access uh, can we make women as participants in these schemes rather than just as beneficiary and i think uh, you know uh, the ujwala program had very you know uh, sort of promising or rather you know inspiring uh, elements where uh, you know the uh connection was given to women uh, to women's name um uh, the there were also component of village level lpg panchayats right where women were brought, brought together made to talk to each other and and you know uh, made aware about the benefits of it although i mean this program can be made further uh, inclusive by also ensuring that men are also participating because unless they also become a convert into the decision making process you're just uh trying to tell those who stand to benefit from it but don't have the agency to but in the longer run of course i think as we all know uh, you know more focus on you know women education and enhancing women's participation into the labor force is what really would uh, you know lead to that you know that change that we all desire that women have the agency to uh, over over matters that affect their health and uh, and then their uh, you know quality of life so i'll stop there uh, and i uh, can answer any follow up questions Thank you, Shalo. That was a very rich uh, reaction. I think uh, Mina wanted to follow up on that. Or? Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, I think there are two aspects. Uh, one should be the convenience, and the other should be the value addition should be there. So, uh, if you are just pushing them to use it, I don't think they, it's going to work ever. So, what I think now, if we make it easier and convenient to use it. so that uh, the rural or urban would any woman should yearn it to have it you know so uh, we should have some uh, values like saving of your time then we can generate some livelihood from that uh, source because as a dentist i have observed that uh, cooking in a solar ovens and all these when you go in clean cooking specifically in solar uh, ovens it actually saves your time it is very convenient you don't have to stand over there like uh, until unless and until uh, the food don't get cooked i can't move from here you can just leave your food in the ovens and you can do your other work so it's very convenient to use it that's it thank you i think this builds well with the point that shallow was making of improving the communication and make it really engaging and relatable to the experiences of women so that it can really become aspirational for them and then and in turn hopefully can also um support their uh their agency in the decision making process i don't know yeah. if professor jyoti you wanted to yeah, add anything i, I would Please. just like to say uh, we should uh, now the people who uh, you know ma manufacturer should get involved into this and really make it uh, versatile enough right now the electric cooking is kind of a, at least in the uh, affluent households it's a second option available if there is no lpg but uh, th that's fine uh, uh, if it uh, but then even then uh, you need a much better uh, uh, appliances that are um, you know efficient they are which are convenient sometimes they don't have vernacular languages uh, explanations are needed prop, uh, on how to do it they should be sturdy enough to, so that um, rural areas um, poor electricity don't doesn't blow them off and so on so they should consider uh, more sturdy and more effective and acceptable appliances Uh, and we should expand the range right now of course we have huge number of appliances uh, ranging from micro oven to uh, electric pressure cooker uh, induction cookers uh, and just plain simple hot plates uh, cooking range and so on so there there is a plethora of there are plethora of uh, uh, appliances but uh, some of them are not really suited for mass uh, uh, um, scale that is needed for sdg 7 so uh, they are good for certain elite urban population but not good enough for uh, uh for, for you know uh, 
as and when electricity electricity they are claiming that they are, it has reached everywhere but uh, uh, not so the quality of electricity and and uh, improvement in appliances is very much essential thank you thank you thank you professor jyoti for adding on on that um I don't know if we are having. Oh yes, we have uh, a participant has raised a comment in the chat. Um, Dr. Ashutosh from uh, Irade, um, as Shalu mentioned, that there is a correlation between women being household heads and LPG usage. Hmm. Oh yes, please. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes, so, uh, can... Alok, as you mentioned, there is a correlation between women household head and LPG uses. However, the literature suggests that normally the poor household where the male member is not there, they generally become the woman household head and they are mostly poor. So LPG uses are not very significantly correlated as per the literature with the household head, men or women. It is possible that if women are working women, in, especially in the urban area, and uh, they are the household load, then it is possible for time saving and other things, they may use LPG. So can you reflect more on it? Like why you have found this phenomenon different from the literature that women household head uses more LPG compared to male household head uh, in the rural area? And why do you feel this will happen if poverty, they are mainly the poverty stricken women in the rural area? And why PMUI is not making any effort <coughs> for the woman, uh, even giving the LPG connection on the woman name? Right. So thanks for that question. Um, I think since I mentioned our finding uh, is in the context of urban slums, right? And that definitely has a different uh, dynamics of uh, different, uh, you know, intra-household dynamics within men and women, certainly. And we, we our, our data suggests that... Uh, and it's, I mean, it's not to suggest that women being household head is the only way to, I mean, it's not a causation, it's just a correlation that uh, in, in uh, women, in, in households where women had a greater say, uh, they were also, we also observe in parallel a greater use of LPG as a primary fuel. Uh, this definitely may not hold true in case of rural uh, households and we have not uh, explored. So I think that uh, difference in intra-dynamic, inter-household dynamics may explain why this finding may differ from the literature. Uh, on the question on why, uh, you know, PMA, PMUY is not uh, leading to a difference, I, I, if I interpret your question correctly, I mean, because that we've already given the connection in women's name, uh, but I mean, should that have changed the situation completely? Uh, I, I think that that expectation is not correct. The idea of giving that connection in women's name, I think was, driven by the fact that we wanted to create an agency that they should own that um, connection and you know it's being recognized that okay they are the prime user of it but ultimately whether it's being used depends on so many other factors right that uh, Dr. Parikh touched and even uh, Sheikal touched in her earlier presentation that we are, it's a question of affordability uh, prices have gone up by almost 50 percent over the past one year it's a question of timely availability of the fuel. I mean, it's a 14 kg cylinder. A woman can't just lift it and bring it to home if it's not being home delivered. So you're still, again, reliant on a male member being able to, willing and able to, uh, you know, go to a nearby provider and bring that cylinder home. And then finally, also, you know, the taste factor comes in. Uh, you know, even in, uh, you know, semi-urban areas, you have a lot of families who would say, we still like to have rotis cooked on uh you know the 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 chula because it tastes better and of course uh that's partly I, I think there's some cognitive dissonance at play that we are able to normalize the you know effects of uh of smoke even though people shall yeah, yeah. Oh, we yeah. lost yeah. her in uh, can I add one uh, one till the Shalu is not there? So, um, Dr. Ashutosh, what I also understand when I spoke to CEW team, so their current study is basically focusing on affordable clean cooking. And they have actually not looked gender angle into that till now. And uh, when we, uh, we spoke and we understand about the mixed program and we interacted with all the agencies, 
So Shalu, I am talking on your behalf. So hope it is fine. So uh, so CW's role was mostly an affordable, bringing the affordability uh, component into that, and not looked into gender angle. So possibly uh, uh, gender ang angle can be looked upon on some sort other uh, uh, studies. But uh, that that's why that's why the, when we had a discussion with the Shalus and team, so uh, so that that that's how we got. So maybe like uh, Dr. Ashutosh, that's why we keep doing lot of series or discussions and all. We are trying to understand what is going to work, and uh, we have some certain idea with which agency is focusing what what. So hope I am able to answer your uh, queries, and we can further uh, further uh, uh, reply uh, reply any of your queries if you want. Yeah. And Shalu, now that you're back, if you would like to uh, continue, I think you are you're also uh, expressing additional thoughts in response to the question. So, so I was almost uh, nearly done. I mean, I was just talking about that how multiple factors uh, influence. I mean, giving out co uh, connection in a manner that's accessible is definitely the first great step. But we need to keep sort of making, uh, you know, other sort of addressing the other barriers that are keeping households from using it in a sustained manner. The question of electric cooking is a very interesting one as well. Um, I mean, uh, we also, I mean, as part of that survey, tried to understand what people think about, uh, you know, transitioning to electric cooking, you know, uh, in full, you know, if they were given an option and would it be reliable, would it be, uh, you know, uh, sort of affordable and would, uh, would they do they think that will be safe as well? And uh, we find very interesting, uh, you know, insights, uh, even though, you know, uh, and then, I mean, in terms of users, I mean, uh, uh, you know, not very few people may be relying entirely on electric cooking, as, you know, uh, you also mentioned, but, uh, you know, the uptake is happening. We see almost 5% people in the country have uh, appliances that they can use for cooking uh, at length, but they're not using it as much. It's a secondary fuel. Uh, and, and that ownership is also, you know, concentrated among uh, mostly urban and richer households, right? Which, which then uh, leads to the point that the devices that are being, you know, made or sold in the market are, you know, tending to that kind of consumer segment. Are we thinking about designing appliances that may be compatible with the kind of cooking practices and appliance, you know, requirement that rural India has? Unless that happens, I mean, even if electricity is accessible, um, even though they, people get, you know, subsidized uh, electricity, the quality is also improving. Unless that compatibility of appliance uh, issue also, you know, gets resolved, uh, the, the transition will be challenging. It will only, you know, become a secondary fuel. And that's what most researchers think that, you know, probably what we are likely to see going forward is a combination of fuel stacking, but of a cleaner stack. So, you know, LPG combined with electric rather than, LPG combined with firewood, hopefully. So yeah, I'll stop here. Thank you. And then we go back full circle to the issue of the te technology mix that was advocated by Professor Jyoti at the very beginning. So thank you very much to all of our panelists for their thoughts and, oh, I'm sorry, there's some issues here, for your thoughts and uh, your experiences. I think we still have a few minutes left uh, before wrapping up the session. So I would like to take this opportunity to maybe um, ask our uh, panelists if they can give a final statement on their views on how the clean cooking sector can be made more inclusive. So in a way, wrapping up and connecting the dots on all the different elements that we have discussed uh, up until now. So maybe uh, I'll go back to the original sequence. Uh, Professor Jyoti, if you would like to go first. Thank you. Um, no, I think uh, uh, we need a... Uh, 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 um, what do you say, a, a blueprint uh, till 2030 saying how we will meet the SDG goals and with uh, a, with what uh, tools, uh, uh, policy tools, as well as uh, a, a, what stakeholders are involved and so on. So we, we um, need to see where are the LPG distributors, why they are not reaching uh, uh, you know, they are beyond 10, 20 kilometers. They are not really delivering. They were expecting people to come and pick it up. Uh, so they, these are the uh, um, matters that one has to look at. 
Naturally, of course, that's uh, usually the men who go there, and so uh, women, women's transport also becomes an issue. Uh, uh, so we need to have uh, figure out what are the current uh, uh, and and uh, must be gradually both the both gender should in, get involved. So certainly, in the elite households, that's that's usually quite now happening uh, quite frequently, but uh, not not in the uh, uh, ones which are who are not yet privileged enough and who actually don't have access are the ones where this is not happening. So I would say uh, planning till 2030 and with the involvement of both the gender. Thank you, Professor Jyoti. These are two very concrete, actionable points that can guide us as, uh, ahead, despite still being fairly ambitious. After all, 2030 is really around the corner, so we need to act fast. Shalu, and your take? Uh, well, I'll, uh, uh, I'll also give two sort of uh, suggestions. I think one is, uh, can we treat the LPG sector also like the electricity sector? I mean, even though LPG sector service delivery may be better, but can we think of, uh, you know, service delivery standards for various, you know, actors involved in the supply chain? Uh, so how do we go about doing it? Uh, the second would be, <laughs> I think it may sound funny, but I think that really strikes at the root of the problem that, you know, we need to also work towards shifting the gender role of cooking. When more men start, you know, taking on the cooking responsibilities, I think the problem of uh, decision making will get addressed very strongly. And that, that of course, is happening, is starting to happen in parts of, uh, uh, you know, urban areas, especially or metro towns. But uh, yeah, I problem think probably... Have, problem would have solved long ago. If that was the case, they should have solved it long ago by both the gender. Yeah. But but we're not working towards it, right? So we are trying yeah. to solve the symptom of the problem. Why not, you know, why, why shouldn't uh, cooking access, uh, cooking energy researchers also look at shifting the gender roles? I mean, we leave that work to the gender or, you know, uh, gender experts. I mean, but it's also a clean cooking energy issue. So, yeah. yeah. I think it's actually a very interesting uh, proposal in uh, as part of that gender and energy innovation program I was mentioning earlier. Indeed, one of our innovators from sub, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, which is actually um, a PR company, so not even traditionally gender experts, they're uh, precisely going about improving access to uh, clean cooking devices by providing cooking classes to men and boys and uh, setting up an online platform for uh, cooking for men. So I, I think, uh, you know, it's uh, it might sound daring, but but that's definitely perceived as a need by many out there. So we are really keeping a close eye on that and see how, how that develops. I'll, uh, I'll let you know, uh, maybe some uh, some findings would be interesting uh, for for you as well. And then- so on, 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 on the positive note, by the way, we also observe that, you know, there's a strong shift happening in the way the burden of collecting firewood is uh, distributed mm -hmm. within family. So earlier it used to be only women or majority women, but now, you know, recent surveys suggest that almost 40 to 50 percent of households, uh, you know, men are also are, are the ones who are typically collecting. And of course, that may be a result of, you know, decrease in biomass availability. So you have to travel stronger, mm -hmm. security concerns come. So whatever dynamics, but that shift is happening. So so I think as nuclear families are also emerging more, uh, mm -hmm. there is an opportunity to actively work towards it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, probably that could be another research sort of program to <laughs> design, <laughs> think about. Thank you. That's another interesting uh, takeaway. And uh, last but not least, Minal, what would be your um, your advice or your, uh, your final statement on uh, how to make the clean cooking sector more inclusive? Uh, I think we should link the clean cooking with their aspirations, with their dreams. Uh, if you could ex uh, establish a single example of a uh, uh, women where they are uh, generating their own livelihood and they are getting their decent income respectable if they are getting profession so though i think we don't have to do, do anything after that because the transition to the clean no. cooking as smooth as the mobiles <laughs> Yeah, I think some examples in that direction are already there, but probably not sufficient enough or not visible enough to really serve as role models yet. So we need to, to scale up the, the visibility also uh, of those best practices. So uh, 
Sheetal, maybe I uh, I hand it over to you. I I think we've got a lot of very interesting, uh, inspiring food for thought from our panelists that are inviting us to reflect on a number of different di dimensions, ranging from the technology to in a way the branding and the engagement of the of the uh, consumer, the participation of women. I really liked also Shalu's point that women should be considered not just as beneficiaries but really as active and equal participants along the whole uh, value chain. We've seen how the, pro the, the issue is really vast and needs to be addressed from a macro as well as micro perspective with input going uh, bottom up as well as uh, top down. So uh, yeah, I think we also got a lot of practical advice on how we can in our respective area of work uh, start really translating this, this input into actionable uh, points. Um, so maybe, uh, Sheetal, I hand it over back to you for your concluding remarks. From my side, I would really like to thank the, the panelists for being uh, so uh, so open and uh, generous in sharing their experiences and, and their thoughts. Uh, it's been a pleasure to meet you all and to, uh, to be part of this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia, and thank you so much for holding the panel um, uh, so generously. And uh, thank you all the panelists. I think we've had some wonderful discussions today, and we were just hoping for one round of session. And I think we fruitfully concluded three rounds of, uh, you know, fruitful discussions amongst the panel. Honestly, uh, sharing that when we were, um, uh, you know, thinking of um, uh, setting up this panel, and bringing about this subject, you know, we initially struggled to actually, you know, get more and more women in, uh, uh, you know, particularly in India, who are working in this sector. So, you know, that actually, um, uh, you know, brought about this thought very actively to us that, you know, uh, as women, we are the primary users of these clean cooking solutions, but, you know, our roles have to be much more than users. And we, uh, uh, you know, we could really understand that if the role of women is, uh, uh, you know, it, through the entire value chain, uh, the uh, transition that we are talking about towards clean cooking could be accelerated at, uh, you know, at an, another level altogether. And we would get solutions which have higher adaptations, you know. Uh, Shalu uh, and the other panelists touched on to the points that, you know, what could be the current barriers and, you know, how could the engagement of women actually accelerate this adaption? And I, I think this is just the starting point. Uh, we need more discussions like these uh, going in the future and more uh, women coming out and playing an active role in, uh, you know, enabling this transition. On this note, I would just like to say that um, uh, we'll be setting up an entire uh, report with respect to the recommendations and the discussions which have been done in this panel today. And, uh, you know, it will be shared on the MEX website uh, uh, quite soon. And uh, uh, we'll be coming up shortly with uh, our next topic for the talk series. As I told you that this is a 12th module session and it's just the six talk series so thank you everybody for giving us this uh, time and this opportunity to connect with all of you once again to all our panelists and sylvia you thank you so much for your time and uh, this discussion today thank you Thank you, Sheena. Uh, and also, I let me take this opportunity to wish everyone a happy end of the year as we are approaching the, uh, the end of 2021. So uh, if you're having a few days off, have uh, a joyful and uh, relaxing break and uh, may the new year be very fruitful and uh, filled with health and safety first and a lot of good news ahead. So looking forward to catching up in, in the uh, new year as well. So best sure. wishes and thanks again for the invitation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Milan. Thank you.